so yeah, my um, I was hoping to talk to you about deployed transfusion. It's mostly a bit of an interest piece, actually, but hopefully we'll get something out of it and a bit of perspective. Um, and basically, I, I, my, the theme of my talk really is the blood far forward um, movement, but also really highlighting how most of what we're trying to do is stuff we've been doing for years and, and gone out of fashion. Um, so, yes, a big canter through the history of military transfusion and the relationship between um, the NHS and the learning we get from that. Um, the challenges of the modern deployed landscape, it's quite different now to what we're used to in, in big war fighting situations. Um, finally, the Blood Far Forward project, and then briefly touching on how that might impact in NHSBT and um, our roles in the NHS. So, uh, Conflict is a powerful stimulus to innovation in trauma and blood transfusion, um, not least, and the first one was done for the First World War, but it wasn't until 1936 that actually um, this Spanish um, legend really uh, developed a fish wagon to, develop, uh, to take blood to the front line um, and experimented with um, citrate and anticoagulants and glucose to help preserve it. So that was really the sort of first um, setup of a, of a deployed transfusion. Um, and during the Second World War, that we were transfusing a lot more than we were in the First World War and using whole blood, actually, mostly. Um, and it was as a result of that um, big war that we then set up the Blood Transfusion Service. Um, and we know how um, exponentially it's grown to the present day. But then we sort of went a little bit backwards in terms of what we now know to be the best way to do things. And in the 1970s, um, there was a study that showed that hypotension was causing problems with uh, tissue injury and various other things. And so a dogma was adopted really to use crystalloids. Um, and it ended up being a three to one basis of crystalloid to the amount of blood loss, um, which really didn't help much, as we'll, um, as I'll explain in a minute. Uh, meanwhile, component therapy obviously was being adopted to address the big transfusion issues in the civilian world, which is um, probably us in haematology, um, with its advantages as, as shown there, um, but wasn't particularly helpful in trauma and uh, major hemorrhage. So in the 1980s and 90s, we were using fluids first and really adopting a reactive blood replacement strategy, uh, waiting for blood tests to come back for coagulopathies and um, low platelet situations to um, transfuse those extra products rather than um, crystalloids and red cells. Um, and then along came the large wars in um, the uh, early 21st century, so the Iraq war, where we saw a lot of casualties and um, innovation at pace, I think. And um, one thing the military is good at is, and actually the NHS was actually during COVID, so it's not, it's not a, a credit to us. But due to the volume of the casualties and the severity of them, it really gave everybody an opportunity to learn very quickly and improve uh, care. Meanwhile, um, Kareem Brohi in the Royal London was work has worked out that coagulopathy was so important to address in trauma patients um, and was an independent marker of morbidity and mortality. And then quite early on in the war, uh, we were using experimental whole blood um, and showed a good result um, in doing so. So then I expect people are aware of the triad of miserable triad of death, whereby coagulopathy, hypothermia um, and um, acidosis uh, have been shown very clearly to result in a rapid deterioration of the patient. And trying to interrupt that vicious cycle is really the key now to trauma and um, hemorrhage management um, in civilian and military circles. Um, and to avoid that is the key to going forward. And why is my slide not working? Ah, there we go. And this is a simplified model of that still. Um, and a lot of work is going into all the metabolic issues with that and trying to improve. So as a result of that, um, not only was the Joint Theatre Trauma Registry set up, which is so helpful um, for looking back and improving practices, but also we um, rapidly went back to a whole blood idea um, or transfusing um, component therapy to try and uh, replicate that in a one to one to one ratio and just transfusing proactively rather than waiting for blood tests and things. And of course, we now know that that is the major hemorrhage approach um, for every every centre now nationally. Um, so from a military point of view, damage control surgery and resuscitation as a concept was being developed and it was sort of coming into the ABC of, of the approach to managing patients um, with the aim of um, minimising blood loss, improving tissue oxygenation and um, improving mortality. 
And I think that's not something that we're desperately familiar with unless we're in trauma circles in the NHS. But um, essentially, damage controls resuscitation is very crudely to try and get a patient to damage control surgery um, and help them to survive that. Um, and it employs everything actually from, you know, very simple adjuncts on the ground to looking after each other with um, tourniquets, tranexamic acid, but really key is early use of blood products en route and um, really going for blood first and as much as and as close to whole blood as we can get. Damage control surgery is essentially a very crude surgical technique. So as soon as the patient's been resuscitated to a degree where they can undergo surgery, they really just have um, very simple and crude measures to keep them um, alive, essentially, so that they can then recover metabolically from all of the hemorrhage. And then once they've settled, then they can then go on to definitive surgery. And this is a, a, a something that's used as a sort of um, example. This is the USS Nevada, which was damaged very nastily in um, uh, by the Japanese and was repaired very briefly um, while still at sea so that it could recover and everyone else on, on board was able to um, sort themselves out before it was then taken to get definitively <laughs> um, uh, repaired. And it actually went on to, to do some serious, um, uh, cause some serious trouble in um, subsequent wars. And it's that as a sort of idea that damage control resuscitation surgery and then definitive surgery at a later date when everything's calmer is really the better way to do it rather than hitting patients who are already trying to survive hemorrhage with nasty surgical techniques that, you know, prolonged acidosis and um, hypothermia um, that that involves. So, um, and that explains what I've just said, really. So going back to the trauma registries, um, people did look back and um, on the you know the data we had and it was shown that quite obviously very sadly quite a lot of the mortality would not have been you know the injuries would not have been survivable but actually out of the 24 percent of people that um or casualties that there were in those wars um 90 percent of them we felt would have been um survivable if they had had better um, blood transfusion in the field and um uh you know in evacuation and in in theater and then further, you know, proper uh, uh, interrogation of the data showed that actually it was the first 30 minutes that was really key in getting people blood before, um, you know, to really improve mortality. And after that, the, you know, tails off, the benefit tails off quite a bit. And this, I mean, this is a very clear slide. Um, you, I mean, sorry, in the sense of you can see the graphs. I'm sure you can't really see what's written on it. But um, this shows that um, if you are given blood, um, uh, quickly you um your chance of surviving at 24 hours and 30 days is exponentially improved so if you look on the left those two graphs the top line is um people that didn't get a transfusion early and the bottom line is those that did um and and the graph on the right what does that show i can't remember oh yeah so the mortality the probability of death is um vastly improved uh, vastly uh, yeah, sorry, your chance of surviving is vastly improved if you had a transfusion within the first 15 minutes, which is the bottom line, which shows a very low um, mortality compared to the top line. And so that really was the basis of um, of our, our work now to try and get blood right at the, in the right place um, to people as soon as possible. The challenge, of course, is the modern deployed landscape, which is very different to Iraq and Afghanistan, so whereby in Iraq and Afghanistan, you'd have a fighting area and then a medical treatment facility in, in close reach with a very, hopefully very robust evacuation um, plan. Unfortunately, you know, for example, in Mali, we're deploying thousands of kilometres away in small teams. So um, it's very difficult to uh, carry blood that far forward and for that long without um, without good cold chain, etc. Of course, the good benefit is that, you know, the people we're treating are fit and young and quite robust, um, but of course, uh, also young, which is a disadvantage to, um, you know, having catastrophic injuries. So that's really been the challenge. And this blood far forward is now pretty much a multinational um, work. A lot of NATO um, focus is trying to get blood in the right place at the right time to people that have been injured in service. And the, our, our mantra is really to get um, is that no service person should bleed to death without receiving blood or blood products or at least having a chance to receive them. 
Um, and we have coined, you know, we've adopted this idea that the 30 minutes is now the golden hour. Of course, the quicker, the better. And we now know that blood is best and saves lives. There is really no point, we feel, in giving fluids um, to patients as it causes dilution or coagulopathy and all of the problems that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we don't necessarily just want to give red cells. As I say, we, we want to give the most appropriate blood components for that patient. And that's basically the three points. So what are we doing to address that? Um, so the first thing is the, the simple stuff, the cold chain. Um, the Credo Cube or the Golden Hour box was developed um, uh, in the Iraq war um, and is really excellent actually. It, it allows us to send blood very nicely from um, NHSBT um, uh, and the Allied um, Centre of Defence Pathology, which is right next to NHSBT in Birmingham, all the way to um, conflict areas. You know, and you know, even with the RAF delays, we can still get it there um, in in good situation. And of course, these boxes are have monitoring um, just like a, one of our blood fridges. Um, and it says for 72 hours, obviously, if if it's prolonged and and the the regist uh, the temperature gauges and stuff are still maintained, that could be a little bit longer. Obviously, we have in war zones the advantage of being uh, so a bit pragmatic, of course, with NHSBT. Um, uh, you know awareness um, so we can be a little bit more relaxed uh, but the second thing really and I think this is where probably we'll see the most change in the next while in the NHS practice as well is freeze-dried plasma um, and this is something which I'll go on to the next slide that we've we've actually been using before but it's had a bit of a renaissance essentially it's um, uh, less than 10 donors plasma pulled into a flask and it's um, it's basically freeze freeze dried and um, it's a bit like a Berryplex product which is reconstitutable with um, water for injections um, and it has a really good shelf life um, uh, it doesn't need any of me to be kept in particularly good um, temperature doesn't need to be thawed of course you're not wasting time thawing it it's equivalent to FFP um, but has really good predictable co coagulation factors in it um, and is very reliable in that sense the other advantage, obviously, is you, you don't need to match for blood type, which is really nice. Um, and, you know, pathogen wise, it's, it's very safe. The only problem is at the moment it's expensive and it's French um, because the French and the Germans are the only ones that really had um, maintained their legacy of production. The Germans have um, we can't get a lot of the plasma um, from Germany because they have a cut off for, for how they stop it when they get to a certain amount of production they stop being a charity so they're very reluctant to go above that and pay all, all of the um, taxes etc that comes with that so for the moment actually internationally most of our plasma is um, made in France um, and we had the military had approached NHSBT a while ago and um, hoping to set up a um, a factory in this country and it was thought at the time that wasn't very beneficial but actually now there is um, plans in the next five years to set that up. Um, I mean, we're already setting it up, but um, hopefully it will be around within the next five years. But as I say, we've been using this um, for a long time, um, but it was limited um, by hepatitis issues um, and HIV. So it really did fall out of fashion, but um, it is something we have used before. It is not a new product. So that's, as I say, I think Lyoplas might be the um, the the big change in what we see in the NHS, um, you know, with the advantages of thawing times. It's already been used on um, air ambulance, et cetera. Um, but uh, another big thing is logistics. And I think that's a very good quote. <laughs> Basically, winning the war is often the uh, often as a result of logistics and blood is no exception to that. Um, and this is how we send our blood abroad. Uh, we really need um, an air bridge to maintain um, supplies internationally, of course, and that's really important. Um, Navy vessels can be used and, and actually, as I'll come to, they provide good places for storage and apheresis. And we are looking into drones, but there's been a bit of reluctance at that, which I'm hoping to um, overcome. Um, and they're planning, uh, as you can see, we anticipate um, this sort of level of um, blood requirements. So eight to whole blood equivalents in 20 to 25 percent of trauma casualties. And there are people employed med planning to work out expected casualty numbers and hence the expected transfusion requirements, which is a slightly miserable job. And I can't spell plasma, it seems. Um, 
but we can rely on other countries and the whole point of, of working with other countries is to try and make our blood um, blood transfusion checks and practices acceptable to other people and likewise them to make them acceptable to us so that when deployed we can rely on these countries um, of which we have an alliance there um, to help us with um, blood supply which is really helpful. And then the other aspect of Blood Far Forward is um, giving, uh, allowing service personnel to donate to each other in the field if required. And that's really useful for these um, these uh, small teams that are going out on deployments um, miles away from any sort of medical treatment facility. Unfortunately, at the moment, we need to use only O donors and they need to be low titer for antibodies. So they're quite limited donors. And of course, the smaller your team, the harder that becomes. But I think moving forward with uh, biomedical scientist support, we can start to provide um, matched blood for um, for service personnel to give to each other. But of course, a lot of regulation and, and problems may come with that. So that's another area that we're working on. And that's basically what I said. <laughs> Non-medical authorization is something we're trying to do as well. And um, so we're training a lot of nurses, paramedics, um, combat medical technicians, which are basically paramedics and um, special forces medics to um, be able to authorise plasma um, in the field and not need a medic, which are in short supply in these areas. And that's a very good um, way of getting blood, um, more access to blood quicker. Um, and as I said, on Navy ships, we are trying to restart um, platelet donations by apheresis. So that could be in a deployed setting, a closer um, way of getting platelets to people. So sorry, that was a bit of a canter through. There's lots of elements to it. And I kind of wanted to highlight the importance of the fact that we shouldn't lose sight. That we're in between um, conflicts. We we often are aware we suffer of something called the Walker dip, which is we get very, uh, very good and efficient during wartime. And then in between when everyone settled down and put their feet up, we forget what we've learned. And then we have to spend the next early part of the next um, conflict relearning stuff. So we're trying to maintain momentum in between conflicts. Um, and working on all of these bits that you can see on the on the screen there to make sure that we can get blood in the right place at the right time and improve our efficiency with that. Um, oh, this is not to forget tourniquets and um, tranexamic acid, but I think we mentioned that. And obviously, if, if service personnel are donating to each other, we need to make sure they've got good iron levels. And that's a focus for, you know, looking at ration packs and things like that, which I'm hoping to explore. So last bit really just to say that hopefully what we learn in um, in war is applicable to trauma in you know in in central London and in nationally um, and you know our practices in the military we, we can help with um, you know improving delivery of blood um, particularly in catastrophes or offshore and hopefully civilian transfusion practice will also benefit with things like lyoplas and, um, you know, the avoidance of thawing times and de delays with that going forward. Um, and that's basically a summary of everything I've said. Um, and yeah, hopefully the future is uh, is optimistic with regards to improving transfusion in, in um, adverse situations.